14. All right, hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, for the sake of the video, this is San Francisco PHP Meetup Group. Um, tonight we're gonna hear about distilling rum. Uh, Chris from New Relic. Um, almost human, right? Is your amorous human, I knew it was something like that, on Twitter. Uh, it's be up on the slides and it's on the site. Um, he'll be talking to us about real user monitoring, uh, so that'll be the topic for tonight. Um, we don't have anything scheduled for next month yet, but I will be getting on that um, as quickly as possible. Um, if there's anything, if you know of a speaker that's looking to talk, shoot me an email, mike at sfphp.org, and we'll see if we can get that set up. Um, other announcements tonight, uh, sponsors tonight is IGN. They provide the facilities, they provided the food, the pizza, the cake and ice cream for our 10 year anniversary. Um, <clears throat> I've been lucky enough to run the group for about six, six years, so it's been a really good run for me. I've had a lot of really nice people, learned a lot of stuff, a lot of good friends out of it. Um, but the group's been around for 10 years. I don't know. Has anybody been here since the beginning? No? I didn't think so, but it was worth a try. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, you know, group's been around for a while. Hopefully we'll be around for another 10 years or more um, as things go along. It's all about... Uh, all of you, so thank you for participating in the group. So really appreciate that. Um, other sponsors for tonight, we've got to give a shout out to New Relic. They provide Chris's time. You know, he is talking and that takes a heck of a lot of time to put together. So big thank you to them. Um, and then we always have an opportunity here. Anybody looking to be hired and wants to give a shout out for themselves, a plug? No, all right, congratulations everyone. Um, and then uh, I know uh, these gentlemen over here wanted to say something quick because they are looking to hire. Um, yeah. All right, great. Anyone else looking to hire? Go for it. All right, great. I think I saw your hand up. Yep, go for it. All right, looked like that was everyone. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Chris, and hopefully uh, we'll learn some stuff really cool tonight. Can everybody hear me all right? Or should I just? Um, awesome. Um, so thank you uh, to IGN for inviting me here. Um, this is the first time I'm actually giving this specific talk. So you guys get to be some guinea pigs. I usually will give a talk once, you know, two or three times at most, and then I'll put them in the vault um, to kind of, you know, go the of Little Mermaid and whatnot. Although, thank God, Lucasfilm got bought by Disney today and Lucas is off the projects. So, if you haven't seen that yet, I imagine you all saw that, right? You're on Twitter, right? Okay. Twitter, Twitter exploded. I think there was more Lucasfilm chatter on Twitter than there was hurricane chatter on Twitter, which I thought was awesome and weird at the same time. Um, so, yeah. So, just some formalities. Uh, my name is Chris Kelly. Uh, I go on the internet by Amateur Human. And that basically is Twitter, GitHub, Speaker Deck. Uh, basically, there's you know only one or two other amateur humans running around, and they're copycats. So don't don't believe them. 
Uh, this deck will end up on speaker deck in the nearish term, so don't worry about taking notes or if you want to steal ideas, you're welcome to. I don't have any care about that, so um, check out speaker deck in a little bit and you'll get that. And also tweet it out and imagine it'll get retweeted. So, um, yeah. So I work at New Relic. Um, how many people are familiar with New Relic? Awesome. That's a good amount, right? Uh, how many people use New Relic? That's a smaller amount. We should change that. Um, so New Relic does application performance monitoring. Um, and what that really means is we do full stack um, evaluation of every web request that comes by. So user hits the page, uh, we're going to record everything from the front end times through the application layer all the way down to the database and report all of that for you. Um, we do it uh, SaaS based, so you don't have to do any hosting or anything. You're just putting an agent in um, your application and it does all the work for you. There's no meaningful amounts of instrumentation or whatnot. Um, we do, and this is the only plug you'll really see from me tonight, so, you know. Um, we do PHP, Ruby, Python, .NET, and Java, um, soon to have a node agent as well. So in today's awesome polyglot world where everything is written in something different, uh, you can kind of monitor just about everything. So, um, and we, I'll show you, you'll see a couple screenshots from New Relic, um, some mostly graphs, um, but if you want to talk about New Relic specifically, I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards, um, take questions, whatever, but I try not to do sales pitches in a, um, presentation because that's no fun for anybody. So what am I? Uh, I do development. Um, I've been a developer for a fair bit of time and I was the CTO at a pretty successful e-commerce platform that got sold to our largest client. Um, after that I moved on to New Relic and I'm an evangelist so that means I get up in front of people to talk about code that I write and kind of get people excited about various technologies and whatnot. Uh, I also drink a lot of coffee um, I might start ranting because I like to get on soapboxes and rant about ideas, um, but primarily I'm a happiness engineer and my goal with that is to make somebody's day better with the stuff that I do. Um, and that's um, sort of my primary focus. And I think that's everybody's, should be everybody's primary focus is whatever we're working on should be making somebody else's day better. Um, and I actually think that's a lot about what rum ends up being. Um, and that's not just a segue, I actually believe that. But Let's talk about what rum is, because rum is a, I don't know, I don't think it's a real standard term. How many people have heard of rum before tonight? So, very few people. So, let's, talk, let's really talk about what rum is. Rum stands for real user monitoring, um, and that's distinguished um, from application monitoring in a, in a very particular way. Uh, what we're really caring about is real users and real browsers. Uh, you know, we, a lot of us have done load testing on our applications by using something like Apache Bench or Siege or any number of our tools. And what we get back from that is a decent amount of information, but our applications are so much more than just a response from a web server. Um, there's a complex network of things going on. There's CDNs, there's uh, assets, there's browsers, there's um, location in the world. All these factors go into how your uh, application genuinely performs. And that's what RUM is really about, is exploring and monitoring the entire stack, not just uh, your application response. So today we're going to look a at a lot of that area, kind of give you some intros to that, where to start, if, you, if you're interested in this, where to go from there. Um, yeah, go from there. So let's take a look at an example. So we're going to watch four um, major e-commerce sites load. And this is what RUM is. RUM is looking at your application from this perspective, not just from a command line to see what's going on. So you can see eBay took a little while. I actually think eBay gets cheated here because they've got some slider that's going on. I think they ended up around like eight and some change seconds. Um, but let's watch this in slow motion and pay attention to what objects are coming into the page and what's happening with the page um, as it goes again. So here it is a lot slower, so you can kind of get a sense of what's going on. So it takes about a second just for anything to ever happen, right? So now we're at one and a half seconds, Walmart starts to show up, Etsy's coming along nicely, Amazon finally catches up, which actually surprised me in this test when I did this a couple times, and eBay finally shows up at three and a half seconds. So you can see the, the, the pages getting loaded kind of progressively, right? And that has a really important factor. Um, Etsy talks quite a lot about this. Etsy actually is a very big uh, PHP shop, if you didn't know that. Um, so if you're looking to work for one of the top PHP companies in the world, Etsy is probably a good place to look. No. What's that? Well, who isn't these days? 
<laughs> um, okay, so as, as C is eBay kind of gets cheated a little bit there. Um, so when we're talking about this and as we're walking through this, I want you to kind of have this sort of slow play in your mind as, as you kind of understand the components that are going on, and we'll explore that a little bit. But really, so what? Like, why does that matter? You're like, I've got this load testing stuff. I've already done it. My application respond, has a response time in under 100 milliseconds. I'm good to go. What does that matter? Well, if we're actually looking at um, what's really important, what's really important is our user, right? Like, our application response time, our uptimes, all those things are just artificial markers that we use. Um, and we even use artificial markers on the front end stuff. Like, we say, like, oh, my onload event hits at this point in time. I don't give a crap when your onload event hits. That's just an arbitrary marker we're choosing. We want to know what the experience that your users is actually having. And so a good application is, has three sort of main pillars, I think. I think there's performance, which is how well it responds to user interaction. There's availability. Is the damn thing even up? And there's functionality. What does your site do? And does it do it gracefully when it's degrading? Because we write fragile applications. These are complex systems that are kind of intertwined with other complex systems. How many people have a Facebook widget on their site? Right? So when Facebook goes down, basically the rest of the internet goes down because most people don't write, uh, don't include these widgets on their page in a way that it doesn't block load. Um, and we can chat about that and that's a whole other presentation. But so why does this stuff matter? Because it matters a lot. So we saw four e-commerce companies. I guess I should ask, what do you guys do as your job? Like, do you work on consumer internet stuff, e-commerce? Like, who, who works in cons a consumer-facing application? So I think that's well over, that's probably well over half, right? Um, so these things really matter. Uh, if you're working on a business application, uh, I would say it matters less, but not, not meaningfully less. Those, your business application, you know, your internal users are just as important as external consumers. Uh, but, so why does this matter? Performance. Uh, page loads that are one second longer drop 7% in conversion. So New Relic actually pays attention to this a lot. We actually have a, a SaaS application that has a shopping system on it so that you can, you know, buy our product. We pay attention to how long our um, page load times are so that we can see what our conversion rates are. So the industry standard, industry reports are showing that we're losing 7% of conversions on, um, with an additional second. It's actually not a long time. Most applications load between four and eight seconds, and a lot are much longer than eight seconds. Another second ends up getting 11% 11 less page views. So if you're working on a consumer application that ends up serving ads, well, 11% fewer page views is pretty meaningful when it comes to the matter, matter, number of ads your sales team has to sell. Um, so one second actually has a lot of impact. And I actually think this one has the most relevance. Um, Amazon, this is an Amazon stat, Amazon says they shave 100 milliseconds off their front page, they increase their revenue by 1%. That's $480 million in 2011, just because they shaved 100 milliseconds off that page. Now, shockingly, um, Walmart beat Amazon when it came to that. So, um, and that's actually new for Walmart. Walmart, if you talk to any of the developers over at Walmart, they've been making massive strides in improving the front page performance because they understand the business value of increasing performance. And so if you don't believe that performance has meaningful business impact, meaningful impact to your users, then um, I, I recommend that you go read some of these studies and understand what your users are experiencing. We're kind of, you know, nerd, so we kind of forget that users experience the web differently than we do, and I think it's really important that we pay attention to this stuff. So that's performance. Availability is important, right? Um, we want to make sure our site is up, but availability is not just, hey, does my site respond? Um, it's, what can I do with my site? And that goes with functionality as well. So this is an Etsy page. Um, Etsy talks a lot about how the functionality of their site works. Um, they've built this site such that if um, one of these other components is blocking, so they have ads that run over on that left side, if that's blocking, the only thing they really care about is the add to cart button and their search function. That's it. And if you remember back to those, uh, the four e-commerce sites, what are the things that came in first? The navigation, so browsing categories, and search. Those are the two things that pop up on everybody's site first, because at very least, the user can start interacting and finding what they need 
as soon as possible. You don't have to wait for the entire paint. You have to just wait for that to show up. So functionality is really important to think about how we do performance um, related around functionality. So we're talking about real user monitoring versus synthetic user monitoring. So the, the difference between real users and synthetic users um, should be pretty obvious, right? Real users are people out in the real world using real browsers doing things. Synthetic users are scripts that we've written, um, systems we are using that are sort of in trying to use the internet, you know, use the browser in a way. So Selenium is a great example of a tool that allows, that drives a browser the way a user would. The problem with synthetic versus real is that there's what's expected and what's actual, right? We use our sites, we built them, so we walk through the flow of the site in a very particular way. Now, the user doesn't always do that. How many people have found errors and problems in their site because a user ended up discovering a chunk of the site that you had no idea they could get there? And how they even got there? With whatever query parameters were included, you're like, I've never even seen that combination. Why didn't you just click these three buttons and you're there? Um, so synthetic monitoring versus real monitoring is really important. Synthetic monitoring has its place, and it's great for a lab situation. But real monitoring is really important because what we care about, again, is our users, not the way we think our users are thinking. Um, users are basically always going to do, as we say, the unexpected. Um, synthetic versus real monitoring is synthetic is predictable. Uh, real, user, real user monitoring is stochastic. So that means stochastic is it kind of shows up in random patterns. There's a really interesting thing about that is statistics and when you're doing trend lines when it comes to real user monitoring can be very, very hard because I don't run Etsy. Um, you know, New Relic collects a lot of metrics in a day. We collect 60 billion metrics a day, but only about 1,000 people use the site at any given time, right? Like, I can't give you a good statistical view of how our site, our site is used because our users are too sporadic. We don't have enough data. So, one of the problems with real user monitoring is we don't always have the right amounts of data and our statistics can be off. So just be aware of that when you're kind of playing around with this idea. Whereas synthetic monitoring, we have very predictable patterns. I can say, I want 10,000 requests to be processed. Now I know I have enough samples to do uh, any statistical analysis on that, right? And you guys are welcome to interrupt me at any time. Feel free, I mean, don't matter. Um, also, synthetic monitoring is predictable in that, in that way that they're going to walk through the application in a very particular way, and it's going to get the main overview of your application, but likely you're going to be able to script the edge cases of your application. Uh, well, the amount of time you're going to take to script all those things isn't going to be worth it. So um, that's where real user monitoring really benefits, is that it's going to find those edge cases automatically. The other thing is synthetic monitoring is biased and real user monitoring is biased, right? Um, synthetic, we build the test. Obviously, the test is going to have biases. We have to be aware of those things. Now, they're not, all biases aren't bad. You just have to be fully aware of those biases. And real user monitoring has biases in that it has missing sample data. Uh, users come from all over the world on all, of, all kinds of different devices, using different browsers. All kinds of crazy stuff is happening. Ad blockers. So there are biases in your real user data. It's not 100% true. Um, so just be aware of those things, and that's all I'm kind of warning on. So there's also HTTP monitoring and browser monitoring. HTTP is pretty basic. It's something like, I want to see if my site is up. So I just ping it, right? That's good enough. Pingdom has made a business off of this. What happens if your site does that? I've had a site that has rendered, has returned a, a 200, but it's missing a chunk because JavaScript is blocking, the code was written such that it can fail, the, the application code can fail and not render a chunk of code. That doesn't do me a lot of good, right? Like, I can't buy my dandy cat now. I can only search for dandy cat. Um, so HTTP monitoring with like something like just a, a, a ping request isn't sufficient for good monitoring. Um, so, all right, well, let's try curl, right? Let's, let's see what the content of that page, is, page actually is. Well, this page downloaded, it's got the right content on it, but it took a second. Well, that's probably not true, right? Because lots of stuff happened. The same page, if I'm looking at, uh, you know, the web inspector, this, this, this page took um, one and a half seconds because I'm pulling a lot of stuff from cache, right? Like, 
curl isn't sufficient just to tell me like, oh, the content on my page is right, because there are so many more things going on. There are, you know, dandy cat pictures being downloaded from a CDN. There's JavaScript that's rendering. There's JavaScript that's repainting the browser. Uh, you know, all these things that affect. So HTTP monitoring isn't sufficient for doing monitoring, right? Good thing is they're both scriptable. You can, you can use components of both. I'm not saying don't use Pingdom. I think Pingdom's really important. I use it. It's um, a rad tool. Um, so use them appropriately, I guess. So am I just kind of just flying by here? I don't know. I'm not sure what my time start, my time start was. Um, and also a little bit, rum is such a weird topic that it might feel like this all comes together in the end. Trust me on that. Um, so we're going to talk about web requests real quick. Here's the anatomy of a web request. If you've never seen, has anybody, has everybody seen this chart or some variation of this chart before? Oh, we'll walk through it more then because it doesn't seem like a lot of people. So this is the full stack from a browser's perspective of what happens in a web browser. So first you're going to get an un unload event. So basically your browser is saying like dump everything that's in there, the page itself. Um, then we're going to do a lot of network stuff. So we're going to do uh, DNS lookups for all, every asset that's in the, um, the page. So um, you know, redirects, you're going to check your DNS for any, so if you're going to etsy.com slash dandycat, um, you're going to check all that stuff out. You're going to get the request. The request is going to hit their server. The server is going to come back down um, and give you all the other things that need to happen. So you get the response from the server. So now you've got your HTML. It's going to have your script tags, your CSS tags, all the images. So then you're going to go through this whole process again for each of those assets. Um, so all of that has to come down. All of that has to then get into the blue section, which is browser execution. And that's going to be um, DOM rendering, DOM painting, CSS selector, um, processing, repainting, and then finally your onload event calls, and then you're done. And then you probably have some onload event that ha triggers this whole process again, and we keep doing this, right? Any questions about that? And this is, um, this one came from, I don't remember all. There's a source in the file, I'll tell you. But this is a very common graphic. You will you see this. And then get to know this, right? Because the future of, of computing is the browser, and the browser is your operating system, and this is your operating system right here. Um, think about that for a minute. Let's look at this in a little bit different way. And this is one of the few new relic graphs you're going to see. So this is a full, this is a 12-hour window of a big e-commerce company that we happen to have a client, uh, as a client, um, not Etsy. Uh, this is Shopify. They let us show their data. So in here, you can see um, average response time is 3.14 seconds. That's a good response time. So we have the blue layer, which is page rendering. So we're tracking things like the paint, the onload event, all that stuff. Uh, we have DOM processing, which is just getting it out and then parsing it with CSS, as well as network time. So that's all that network back and forth. And the web application layer, which is this purple layer here. So that's, that's all the time that got spent in your, in your web application uh, in order to generate a page. So let's, let's expand that out. That's 84 milliseconds. So we took 84 milliseconds across 3,140 milliseconds. That's, well, I think I calculated 3.5%, 4%. How much time do you spend working on this section of your application versus working on that section of your application, everything here? Who, who spends 80% of their time probably working here? How much, you spend 80% of your time working on, if you were working at Shopify, 4% of the response cycle. Um, on average, most consumer, and now Shopify has done a really great job of, of optimizing the site. Consumer internet, on average, uh, it's about 80% of the um, re entire request cycle is on front end. The other 20% goes to your back end. But this goes to show a lot, right? Like, our real user monitoring is sort of an emerging field because we've spent so much time in this section. We've spent, and that's fine, that's great. I'm not saying neglect this from now on, because this will go to hell in a handbasket. Uh, but we have to not forget that there is anywhere from 80 to 94% other things going on um, in a request. So um, I just wanted to show you kind of that perspective versus this request cycle perspective. Yeah? What, what browser is that? This is all requests. Which one are you talking about? 
this, what are these requests? These are all requests from Shopify. So they have thousands of requests at a time. So it's all browsers for them. So this is a, a large aggregate uh, across a 12 hour time window. So it's a large aggregate. Yep. Yeah. And we'll talk about that too. So how do we do real user monitoring? If you're like, well, real user monitoring is important. This is how we do it. This is your end user. So people around the world, that's your application sitting in AWS or Rackspace or wherever else you happen to send it. Um, and then over the end is New Relic. So what happens is we have a couple things going on. We have a beacon. So the way we do it is on every request, we're going to inject a small, tiny bit of JavaScript onto your page. That's non-blocking, obviously. Um, and it's going to send back information about the front end response. And it's got a unique ID in there identifying that, that request. At the same time, that request gets tied to an app application request. Um, so we collect, so that all goes to the beacon. The first part goes to the beacon. You don't really care about that part. Um, and the next section, the, the top middle, is uh, your application's response time. So that's collecting all of that data, right? So all of this is coming into our collector. We do that about 60 billion times a day right now. Um, so we have a lot of data and we do this a lot. Um, and then we also have what's called a pinger, and that's a thing that sits on our servers and makes sure that your, your application is responding properly. So um, that's how we collect all this data and how we do all of that, and that's basically how real user monitoring is done everywhere, is that you have both um, application, well, you, hopefully you have application monitoring as well as front-end monitoring, um, as well as a pinging system as well. So if you want to roll your own, that's kind of what you need to do it. Any questions so far? So yes and no. So not to pitch New Relic, we actually have a, a report that will show you as your requests, as your load um, number of requests goes up, what happens to your application. Um, so Shopify, for example, theoretically, you're going to see a very small slope if you've done your application development in a, a very good way. Your response time will grow. There's no question about that. But it's a matter of it'll grow at a much uh, slower, lower slope than a, um, you know, a one for one comparison. So just depends on how your application development is done. And I can show you that later, like afterwards. I can, I'll gladly show you the, how that looks and why that's the case. Does that answer your question a little bit? So? Absolutely, yeah. It's how you develop, it, it's your code, it's your infrastructure set up. All, all of that is a big ball of mud that ends up determining what your slope looks like. So. Um, and unfortunately, New Relic does not have a magic wand that says, hey, fix this chunk of your code, and this is how you fix it. We can't tell you that much. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah, so like you can see here, we include a memcache layer, so where it's hitting between the database for them. Uh, if you happen to be using Varnish on the front end, um, that'll be a whole other layer of caching going on. So. Caching actually solves that at most people's problems, um, and most people don't do caching well. And I think that's what we should spend our time on, not writing node apps. Soapbox, look what you guys did to me. I'm sorry? Yes, it's one of the two hard problems in computer science. Anyone tell me the other two? Um, OK. Any other questions before I move on to AppDex? Hopefully I'm not boring you guys. Uh, AppDex, what the hell is AppDex? AppDex is an industry standard, meaning application performance index. Um, I didn't know about AppDex until I, I worked at New Relic. Most people don't know about AppDex. What it is, is a way of measuring how your users are experiencing your site. Um, so you have some time threshold, which we'll call T. Um, let's call that three seconds, so in, in Shopify's their, their target response time is three seconds. So um, a user is considered satisfied when it's less than three seconds, when it's between three seconds and 40 or 12 seconds. Uh, between three and 12, it's going to be tolerated. And if it's over 12 seconds response time, then it's frustrated. Um, and the way your AppDex score is, what you're getting is, a, is some kind of proportion of one. So you, cal you calculate your AppDex score by doing satisfied people plus half your tolerated people divided by total. So. That's, the, that's an industry standard thing. It's not a new relic thing. 
You can go to appdex.org, I believe. Um, Google will tell you for certain. Um, and that's on there. So we use that, and this is what an AppDex score looks like on, um, on our, in, a, in our storefront, what, where you go and sign up for New Relic. So you can do alerting, monitoring on AppDex. That's a really good metric to give you a one line kind of, how is my application doing right now, right? It's in the same way that you might look at your load average to see how your, your server itself is doing or your memory usage. Like It's one of those. Here's a summary metric that gives you information um, that can kind of tell you if it should be panicking or not, right? And we want it as close to one as possible. Um, so when it dips past 0.7, you're kind of in, um, in trouble. Okay, so that's AppDex. So there are a lot of factors to RUM, right? There's not just how your application is written. There's uh, latency factors from desktop and mobile. So on average, this information is from Strange Loop. They do lots and lots of studies on um, and awesome stuff on um, performance in general. Josh Bigsby is awesome. Um, so are you on a mobile phone or are you on a desktop, right? We're kind of back in, I would say, 2004 when it comes to the network times that we have and the processing power we have when it comes to mobile phones, right? Like the same internet I was using eight years ago is what I'm using when I use my phone. It's awesome, um, but as somebody mentioned as we were chatting, my expectations haven't changed. I don't like, oh, I'm on my phone. I should be able to tolerate this stuff. No, I get irritated. I'm like, this page responds super quick. So there's that. There's latency when it comes to those devices. There's physical latency. Um, so from the US East group of, of AWS to London, it's 169 milliseconds. To California, it's 73 milliseconds. Granted, it's a little longer, um, but it's not twice as long, um, just as a, as a factor. Um, Verizon, who runs a, a backbone network, tran um, reports that Transatlantic is 84 milliseconds latency on their network, and Transamerica is 41. So this is not terribly different from that, right, proportion-wise. So we've got our physical locations. So if you take a look at our AppDeck scores, this is, again, Shopify. Um, if you take a look at, against uh, AppDeck scores across the world, you can see that the world is very different, right? Like if I'm in China, my experience of Shopify probably doesn't exist. Um, you know, South Africa, like these are customers and these people are important. Like we spend a little too much time thinking about what's going on there and New Relic is a victim of this where we kind of focus a lot on our US users and forget, by the way, we have this whole international audience that um, wants to use New Relic. So when you're thinking about application performance and we'll get into this a bit later too, things like CDNs help you solve some of these problems, right? If you put an edge server over in Europe those serve, all the assets being served for that are being served out of Europe instead of out of the United States. And you don't have 169 millisecond delay, you have something much smaller. So um, another factor is what browser people are using. Uh, this is a browser mark score. Um, so the higher the better, score itself doesn't really matter, so there's no numbers on here. But you can see um, IE9, shockingly, is beating out a couple things. But browsers are different. Windows versus Mac are different. Um, Windows Chrome versus Mac Chrome is different. Like these are all factors that go into real user monitoring that um, we don't have to really deal with when we're just talking about application response time. If I'm using Apache Bench and just slamming my API, that's great. This is a different world. This is what my users are experiencing, all the variables that have to go into it. So let's try to make some things better. Um, right now, HTTP Archive reports that the, um, the average page size is about one megabyte. That's up from 2010 from 700K. So our sites are getting bigger. Um, the average number of objects on, a, on a, an individual page is 83 objects. So we have to make 83 requests um, across all kinds of places. So if we remember back here, right? If I have to make 83 requests across the Atlantic, there's TCP um, overhead that's going to go on there. There's a latency that's re related to that. Um, all those things that go along, as well as that one megabyte. Now I have to send a, a megabyte across. I really have a fly on my. Um, now I have to send a megabyte across the Atlantic rather than 700K across the Atlantic. All of these things really matter. So um, let's try to make these things better. So we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the, a couple of the 14 rules. Are you guys familiar with the 14 rules of web performance? Oh, how 
dare you. Okay, so Steve Souders uh, used to work at Google, um, founded the YSlow project. Uh, you might be familiar with YSlow. Um, currently, what did I say? Steve Souders works at, used to work at Yahoo, currently works at Google, excuse me. Um, and he identified 14 rules for faster websites. Uh, it's a gr great book, lots of resources online, make sure you read them. So we're gonna look at a couple of those and why they, why they're, why they matter, right? So make fewer HTTP requests. So this is our dandy cat. I'm gonna buy that thing since I've, I've written a, a presentation on it now. Um, so this makes, I believe I counted 54, um, 54 objects on it. So how can you resolve those? So if you wanna make fewer, fewer HTTP requests, you can use sprites, so combine your uh, small assets into um, individual ones. There's differing opinions on that. Some people will say a sprite and CSS transforms take longer in the entire request cycle than for individual asset downloads, right? So this is not a one-size-fits-all kind of problem. There's different opinions on it. Um, you wanna combine your JavaScript, so uh, not to use Rails as an example, Rails asset pipeline mashes every JavaScript that's in your application into one single file, so now you're only downloading one JavaScript file and putting that into the, into the browser cache so you don't have to download it again and again and again, um, rather than downloading multiples and um, not being able to cache certain ones. You can do the same thing with your CSS, right? You can just, all of our CSS can exist in one. There's no need to have it um, in multiples as you move throughout your site. Now, I wouldn't say you should have your admin CSS being served up to your customers um, because they don't need that asset and the browser will actually block until all assets are downloaded. Um, then I don't, I don't recommend that. I also don't recommend putting a print style sheet on a page that's not dedicated to printing your page because my iPhone doesn't give a crap about your print style sheet 99.999% of the time. So don't send it to me. Um, and use fewer tracking widgets. We, I think New Relic has like six tracking widgets on our site. You know, our marketing team uses all kinds of random stuff from Optimizely to Google Analytics to all of those. So all of those are making requests as well. If you looked in this list, you're gonna find things calling out to third-party services that are making calls, right? Because out of, of those, of those 85 objects, or 83 average on average objects, those, some of those are JavaScript files out to other services. Um, and also use a CDN. CDNs aren't a guaranteed win, but they're a most of the time guaranteed win. Um, you have to do that in a very particular way, and we can talk about some specifics later. Um, but yeah. So make fewer HTTP requests. Use expire headers. Expire headers are cheap. So if you look in this list here, content, you see from ka, that says from cache when you expand it out. That means my expire headers were set properly to show that I can hold onto that object for, I'm not sure what Etsy has them set at, but probably 10 years from the data it was originally downloaded. So for the next 10 years, I can download, I can keep using this JavaScript file that has a fingerprint on it. So that way my, my as the gentleman over there uh, mentioned, expiring that isn't a problem because every time I, I push a new version of this JavaScript file, I fingerprint it. Um, it's simple. Apache expires default. Nginx expires. There's a couple, a couple flags that you set, whatever you want, those are done. Anyone have a question? And generally you're gonna see a 59% improvement. If you don't have to keep making your users download this file, um, you know, if that JavaScript got downloaded on the front page, I never have to download it again because I set my expire header I'm gonna get roughly a 59% improvement on performance time. It's pretty good. Gzip compression. So, hopefully everybody has Gzip turned on, and if you do one thing when you go home tonight, it's turn on Gzip compression. That is the one thing. If it's not on, turn it on. It is a free thing. It is a win. All decent browsers today do it. Uh, I think IE6 is the one that you have to put special rules in for. Um, so. Sorry, if you <laughs> have to support IE6. Um, so gzip compression, if you're just gzipping your HTML, you're gonna save about 10% on the, on the network time. Um, if you gzip everything, you're gonna on average save about 40% of time. And the reason for that is a G, to gzip uh, 1K is about 3,000 nanoseconds, 0.01 milliseconds. To send a 1K, um, 1K object across a one gigabit network, is about 10,000 nanoseconds. So it's cheaper to compress it and send it along, so long as your compression is at a certain level and you can generally expect 
70%. So here's an example, right? This is the uncompressed amount of time and how long um, a green one's the uncompressed amount of time. So as my objects get bigger, as I get closer to that one megabyte um, total, it's taking me much longer if I had both compressed it, so the gzip time as well as the transfer time included. Um, on very small things, you don't get a lot of win, um, but on most things, you're going to get a win. Uh, there's no point in gzipping um, images because they're already compressed by their nature, and PDFs, same thing. But um, your raw text, your CSS, your JavaScript, your HTML, all of that can be compressed. So you should. Um, last bit, put your CSS at the top, put your JavaScript at the bottom, and put all of it on an external server. Don't serve, or on an external asset. Don't serve JavaScript and CSS in line. Um, so browsers will block because CSS is waiting to download, because what has to happen is um, the CSS has to download, the, the DOM has to download, then all the selectors have to be processed, and if you put your CSS at the bottom, your DOM is already there, and the processor, again, because your browser is now a new operating system, you, you can't get pre-processing of your selectors, right? As the, as the DOM is being loaded, it can already start working on that process. Um, so you want your CSS at the top. You want your JavaScript at the bottom, mostly because um, those assets aren't critical, right? So uh, the JavaScript won't execute till the DOM's already done, so why block at a JavaScript download and, and let it go to the bottom first so you can get all of your HTML out first? And then you want them both off of the page for, that same, for a lot of those same reasons. Um, if the DOM has to download entirely before the CSS on that page can be processed because it can't, it can't process the script tag until the page is entirely downloaded because it doesn't know that it's closed yet, um, it has to wait. So, and then you can also put those on to different CDN asset, um, CDN domains so that they can be downloaded in parallel. So all of that, do those things. CSS up, JavaScript down, and send them, get them both off of your page. Um, inlining, those things are generally bad. So some stats on that if, you, you know, if you're taking, keeping score here. Um, minifying these assets will end up getting you about a 15% increase. Um, putting your CSS and JavaScript at the bottom, that's about a 20, 18%, 20%. And then moving it off, you get a, a, anywhere from a 30 to 40% increase on your, on your um, user time. Questions, thoughts, concerns? Are you asleep? Do you need more sugar? There's cake. I heard there's cake. And ice cream. Uh, all right. So. Performance testing, so all, we've done some, you know, here's all these things, how do we kind of work with that? So performance testing can be, um, can be done in a couple ways. So there's Apache Bench and Siege, again, we talked about that a little bit, how those are only useful for very particular um, elements. You can, testing an API with Apache Bench is great. Um, testing a web application with Apache Bench, not so much. So, I suggest doing automated testing. Um, I have done a tutorial on how to do automated testing. You can use AppFog to set up your infrastructure. If you're not familiar with AppFog, it's a um, uh, platform as a service, so you can run your, feel free, don't, no interrupting, Sorry. no worries. Anyone else want a soda while she's there? No? Um, so AppFog does platform as a service, so you can, you can load your, you can set up your servers, well, you don't have servers to set up. They're gonna run all of that for you. You can just put your code up there and it's just gonna run. Um, it's brilliant. You're not gonna have your biases that usually come when you're setting up your own lab infrastructure. So um, a lot of people will do performance testing on their laptop. I hate to tell you, but your laptop doesn't have the capability of both slamming itself with Apache Bench and serving a request at the same time. So that, think about those biases. Like think about the, the lab environment you would have to set up and the time it would take to do that and then think about how little time it takes to set up AppFog, which is a matter of signing up some stuff and pushing some code, and decide that. NewStars uh, is a um, performance sort of monitoring as well as automation tool. So they have a, a, um, a product called Web Performance Testing. I think it's a really poorly named thing. Um, but it used to be BrowserMob, if you're at all familiar with that, and it runs uh, Selenium. Um, Selenium is a headless, scripting system that allows me to basically 
drive a browser and interact it with like a, like a user would by examining the DOM, fire and click events. So your AJAX calls actually get called, your JavaScript actually executes. But those things on our applications really do exist. And then use obviously New Relic to do the performance monitoring. Um, let me show you Selen uh, Selenium script so you kind of have an idea of what's going on. So New Star, these are all hosted services, so you don't have to do any setup. So if you want to do performance testing with actual browsers, um, this is the simplest, easiest, and most recommended way because setting up your own lab infrastructure sucks. So um, Selenium is written in, in a number of languages, but this one happens to be JavaScript. So first I'm going to set up a web driver, and so that's basically a call to open up a web browser. Um, we get the client, we start the transaction, so this is basically, now we're basically telling um, New Star to start recording. I'm gonna go get my, my front page. Um, it's gonna have a sign up form on it, because why wouldn't it? Um, I wanna find a, an element with sign up in it, I'm gonna click that button. Then I'm going to find a form on the next page, because now I've navigated to a sign up form itself. Um, and I'm going to fill out all of this information under my form. I'm gonna click submit. I'm gonna wait for all my network traffic to stop, which is just a, stand this is just a standard Selenium thing. And then uh, into my transaction, I'm gonna record that information. So that's, and then I'm gonna tell Selenium, or I'm gonna tell Newstar, do that for 15 minutes a thousand times. And I'm gonna get massive amounts of data about what my sign up form does. You're gonna see things, um, like we were talking about in the back, of where does my, at what point does my application's threshold be like, well, now I've, because they can ramp it up. It'll say, so in the first minute, they'll put 10 users. In the second minute, they're gonna put 100 users. In the third minute, they're gonna put 1,000 users, or you define these things. Um, and you can see where your application starts to fall over. Where does your database start to bottleneck? And this is just a simple, like, data, this is just an insert into a database. Imagine uh, where this came from. I, was, I made a Twitter clone. What I did was I had a user um, get created, follow another user, sign out, do that again. I did that a bunch of times over a bunch of minutes. And I can see where my application starts, where I can find my N plus one queries, um, because as I started to look at that follower page, I could see where I kept on making more and more calls, um, things like that. So those things are really hard to find in development, um, but with automated testing, uh, it's not that bad. So this is Selenium. Um, I promised I wouldn't do a a uh, new Relic demo, so it's just gonna be, I'm gonna tell you to measure all the things, um, and I will gladly show you New Relic if you guys so, so want, but um, I didn't want to pitch you guys. So, um, we're almost at eight o'clock, so questions? New Relic has three, uh, well, let me jump to this slide. Um, <laughs> So we have three tiers. It's a, as I said, it's a hosted SaaS application. We have a free tier um, that's free forever. That's gonna give you only, let me think, 30 minutes of data retention. So you can only see what your application has done in the last 30 minutes, um, as well as it has a, a limited feature set. There's a middle tier, um, which is really good for most people, and actually we have, is the free version if you're on one of our hosted partners. So AWS, AppFog, Heroku, Bluebox, a bunch of other, Rackspace, Chances are, if you're running an application, you might be running on one of those. So you can actually get our standard version for free right now. That's seven days of data retention and pretty much all of our features. And then once you've kind of exhausted all the information that New Relic can show you on, on standard, we have our pro version, which is unlimited data retention, so you can do incident response and things like that and go back and, and review postmortem stuff as well as every feature we have. And that's things like SQL explain plans, so you can get find where missing indexes happen to be, things like that. Um, so yeah, we have free as well as paid versions. Um, we're doing, like I said, 60 billion metrics a day, uh, monitoring 500,000 applications at any given time, um, PHP, Ruby, Python, .NET, and other things. How does the agent work? Um, so. So we have the different agents, and they all kind of function a little differently, but basically, um, the way our agents work, because there's no additional instrumentation that you have to do. You don't have to go back through 30,000 lines of code and say, time this, count that, all that. What it's doing is it takes your original method, and we're, depending on your language, um, we're monkey patching it. We're saying, we're gonna, we're gonna create our own method, 
um, put a timing wrapper around it, and then execute it and change the names around. So that's basically how met the metaprogramming works in all of them. In Java, we're doing bytecode instrumentation. Um, uh, I think it's, so I'm not, a, I'm not, it's done in C, actually, so I'm not an expert in it. Yeah. I'm sorry? Do we provide a C extension? Yes. Yes. Is, so is New Relic overriding, I guess I should probably try to answer it, but um, is New Relic overriding, no, it's fine. The, is, are we overriding the original methods? You won't have to, so we will be able to identify the vast majority of the things going on in your application. There are certain things you might want timed that we're not timing by default, and there's, that's all done in a configuration file. And you just tell us where the methods are. Yes. What's that? Does it work? Uh, yes, uh, it works very well. Um, so if you want to know more about that. So we, our agents don't add any more than 3% um, overhead to the application. And that's actually only 3%. Let me go all the way back. Did I miss it? No. So that's only 3% to this layer, right? Um, so if you have a 3,000 millisecond request and you're doing 100 millisecond, um, application response, it's only 3% to the 100 milliseconds. So it's not really that impactful to your application. I'm sorry. No, not that I know of. Um, yeah, not that I've, I've heard of. So. Um, and we release new agents uh, pretty regularly. Um, our PHP agent, I think, is mostly our newest one. I want to say, but we have, that's our fastest growing agent um, because I don't think the PHP community has been blessed with application performance tools um, the same way like a Java community has, right? Java has had app performance stuff very long time. <laughs> Nobody thought PHP could be fast. Um, any other questions, thoughts? I'm, Where do I get the number for? Oh, um, the, so there's one from, the revenue number specifically is reported by Amazon. Um, and that's, and the other two numbers, wherever they happen to be, doesn't matter. Um, the other two numbers were reports off of, I want to say strange loop. Or that's where those numbers came from. The 7% uh, um, decrease in page views and 11% decrease in conversions, or maybe that's reversed. So those are, those are strange loop studies, and then the Amazon revenue number comes directly from Amazon. So, yeah, yeah. So that's all, so the question was for the, the camera. Um, where do the numbers for satisfied versus tolerated come from? So you, you identify a threshold. So um, I think the default in New Relic is four seconds, but you can change that. And then satisfied is a, anything less than that four seconds. Tolerated is anything between four seconds and four times four seconds, so 16 seconds. That's, it's part of the AppDex formula. Um, so it's anything between four and 16 seconds. And then frustrated is anything beyond 4T, which is 14, er, 16 seconds. So it's all part of the app dex, I guess, spec. Yeah, and but you identify how fast you want your application because, um, you know, a blog should function differently than an e-commerce site should function differently than a um, bank or 
an ad service. You know, so you can you can identify that how you how you need it. Any other questions? Awesome. Um, so, yeah, let me um, put that up there again. You can clap. It's cool. <laughs> I just do this. It's faster. So again, um, uh, so newrelics.com slash sign up. There's a promo code for field um, SFPHP NOV for November. That that code is good all the way through November. That'll give you a 30-day free, free trial of our pro version. Um, and you should try that. I'm amateur human on the internet. I'm more than happy to take questions uh, on the internet, after the internet, wherever. Um, if you want to see a demo of New Relic, I'll gladly stand up here and give you one. Um, but I don't want to waste everybody else's time. So if you feel if you if you don't want to see a demo of New Relic, feel free to get up and leave. Uh, <laughs> um, I can actually I have a very sh quick. Um, Oh, that's terrible. <laughs>